Hello, and welcome to Doug Doug's Advice for New Content Creators. This is a video I've wanted to make for a while, not only because people ask me about this sometimes, and it'll be nice to point them to a video and say, hey, go just watch this, but also because I am super passionate about this. This is something I think about a lot that I thought about for the many years while I was trying to make it as a content creator and eventually sort of succeeded. And this video is going to outline what I think is the critical mentality and focus you should have as a new content creator in order to maximize the chances of you actually becoming successful and growing a major audience. In my opinion, the vast majority of videos like this that I've seen from other content creators are all about marketing. They will describe things like what platform to be on and how frequently you should upload and like how to get eyeballs on your thing that you made, whether it's the, you know, the platform or the technology or whatever it is. And then at the end, they'd be like, and remember, the most important thing is to make great content. And it's like this afterthought. But, but that's the most important thing. Making great content is the hard part. That is the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter how good your marketing is. If you're not making something that's interesting, nobody will care even if you market it successfully at people. So this video is all about how do you learn to create great content? You can worry about all the marketing shit later. There's lots of other people out there who can talk about marketing. This is uh, this video is not about marketing. I'm not going to tell you what technology to use or the camera or the video game or the schedule or the platform. None of that shit matters. All the little details do not matter. What matters is that you make great content. And I believe we can break this into three core themes. Number one is good versus great and why great content is critically important in this goal of growing an audience. Number two is your skill mix. How do you provide something that is irreplaceable and unique? And number three is the one year plan, a plan that worked for me in becoming a content creator and that I think really maximizes or at least greatly enhances your chances of making something that is really awesome that people care about by the end of, let's say, one year. Just to be clear, uh, in the context of this video, I'm gonna be talking about success as growing an audience. This is all about how to build a channel that is successful and ideally that you can live off of. If that's not what you want, that's totally fine. If you just wanna make stuff because you love making stuff, I'm happy for you, that's awesome. Uh, but this video is going to be focused on like what you have to do to grow an audience and become successful in this sort of like business and viewership sense. And I will be attempting to explain all of this with food. Okay, let's kick this off with chapter one, good versus great. This is a, a good versus great is like a theme people talk about in other contexts, but I'm gonna define it specifically for kind of YouTube type stuff. So I believe to grow an audience, you have to make something that is great. And the reason is humans have Preferences. Uh, we all enjoy doing things. Uh, every human on earth, especially at this point with, you know, infinite entertainment options in front of us at all times, like we all have things we like doing and that we like spending our time on. Nobody in 2022, at least in, in like the YouTube Twitch world, is like at a loss for things to do and watch, right? They have things they already like and do, or at least they have a billion options at their disposal. So if you are going to grow an audience you have to be better than people's existing preferences, right? It is not enough to just be like pretty good. Like if you just, hey, you do a good job, like cool, good for you. But everybody has the things they already like that they really, really like, and that's what they spend their time doing. And so with every single human on earth, if you are trying to become, if, if you want them to start viewing your stuff, you have to be better than the stuff they already like. You're also at a disadvantage because people like familiarity, right? People don't really want to switch to new stuff. So you're competing against what they already like and against the comfort of familiarity. So that's what you're up against, right? Which is important to recognize, um, which is why great content is important. To me, great content is something that is unique and irreplaceable. You cannot get it anywhere else and it does not compete with anything else. Let me describe why this is important with food. Um, imagine that YouTube and content creation, all right, instead of being YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and TikTok or wherever you want to make stuff is imagine that it's a gigantic food court. Okay. This is a food court that is like the it's like the size of California. Okay. And there's like 10,000 hamburger shops and they're all free. Okay. Every single hamburger shop just like gives out their hamburgers for free. The only thing it takes is time. Right. And you come along and you're like, wow, I fucking love to make food. I want to be, I want to be a hamburger shop. Like I want to get in here and succeed in this hamburger food court. Now, if this is the situation, what is the ideal way to break in and succeed in this food court that has, I mean, literally just like as far as the eye can see in every single direction, just miles and miles and miles and miles, just going infinitely into the distance, there's already hamburger stores. Okay, there's so many fucking hamburger stores. And let's say five guys is the most popular, just for the sake of argument. Now, your initial temptation, and this is true for most people who try to get into content creation, will go into this food court and be like, I wanna make, I wanna make some fucking hamburgers. 
Well, Five Guys is really, really good. Okay, Five Guys is the really popular one. I should imitate Five Guys. So then you start a new, you know, you start the 10,001 hamburger store way down at the end of the chain, and you try to, you try to make Five Guys burgers, like just like they do it. What would happen? Nobody will eat at your crappy Five Guys. Not only are you unlikely to exactly match the quality of Five Guys, like Five Guys is doing their own thing. It's not like you can perfectly replicate what Five Guys is doing. So like you're going to be sort of a, an imitation of Five Guys, but not quite as good. But people already have Five Guys, right? They already have the thing that they like. Why would they go to yours if it's just an imitation or a different version of the thing they already like and can get as much as they want? Even if you were to somehow perfectly match the quality of Five Guys and you call it like Frankie John's or whatever, people are going to be like, well, let's just go to Five Guys. We know fi I, we like Five Guys. I like Five Guys. Let's just go to the place we know, right? Again, you have familiar. People are going to stick with what they know they like especially if you're not doing anything different. So what is the obvious solution here in this food court? Well, it's to create a type of hamburger store that sells burgers that people can't go get at Five Guys. They cannot go get at any, at any of the other 10,000 stores that are in this food court. You can't just go in and try to make the best burger. You can't just try to be better than anybody else because there's 10,000 competitors. And if we're talking about YouTube, it's 10 million competitors. What you can do is create a unique genre. So how do you do that? And this is the secret to this whole video. <clears throat> you don't try to make the best hamburger store. You try to make the best fusion restaurant. You take two different cuisines and you combine them together. And by combining two different cuisines together, you make something that is unique. You could make the first spaghetti hamburger, American and Italian. And you put like a bunch of spaghetti like in, the, in a normal hamburger. And that sounds disgusting, right? And most people would probably hate that. But it would be very unique. It would be very fucking different from what Five Guys is doing. You're now the first in the spaghetti hamburger genre. You're not the 10,000th, right? And nobody, when they see what you're doing, is going to be like, oh, uh, well, we could just pick up Five Guys. They're going to be like, okay, that sounds disgusting or completely awesome, and that's its own thing. And probably <laughs> most people who come try your spaghetti hamburger will hate it, probably the majority of them. But imagine if you're the customer or customers who come in and they fucking love it and they love the spaghetti hamburger, okay? And this is the critically important thing. If some guy walks in, he's like, all right, I'll try this. This sounds revolting. And he takes a bite and he's like, this is weird, but I kind of love the, t I love the mix. It's just different from like all the other stuff here. That guy who does like your stuff will always come back. There are no competitors to what you're doing with the spaghetti hamburger. He's not going to go to Five Guys instead of yours because you're the only one offering this unique product. And here's the secret. Here's the amazing thing about a fusion restaurant as opposed to just one like cuisine genre. You don't have to be the best at both cuisines. In this scenario, you don't have to be the best Italian chef and the best American chef to make the best spaghetti hamburger, right? All you have to do is be quite good at both of those things. And then by combining them, you're making something that is the best in its subgenre, right? So a fusion restaurant allows you to compete in a super tiny category, and then you only have to be better than a couple people. So you have this incredible advantage at retaining people, at getting, you know, getting interest and retaining people who like what you're doing because there's going to be essentially zero competition. I have an actual real food example from this. In 2013, I, I was living in San Francisco, and we started, I, my friend was like, oh my God, there's this new place called sushi burritos. They're making like, it's like a burrito, but it's sushi in like a burrito style. And I think this is like somewhat common now, but 10 years ago, it was not. I would, nobody ever heard of this. And so me and friends went to this thing and it was, you know, like it wasn't like the greatest thing ever, but it was so much fun. It was super unique, right? I had never seen anything like this. The line was like way out the door. It was incredibly popular. And again, this was not the best sushi I've had by any means. It was not the best Mexican food I've had by any means. But the combination was so interesting and fun and unique. I wanted to go back. Lots of people went back. That restaurant was very successful. And again, it's like, what's going to what's gonna have a higher chance at building a new audience? The 10,000th Mexican restaurant in San Francisco, the 10,000th sushi restaurant in San Francisco, or the first sushi burrito restaurant in San Francisco? I think the answer is fairly obvious. So let's compare this dumb analogy back to YouTube, okay? And we'll use my channel. So 
I think my content, and presumably you are familiar with it or like it if you watch this, if you're watching this, um, <laughs> my stuff is pretty weird. I think my stuff is is very strange, um, and I try to unapologetically be as weird as possible. I've mentioned in the past how I was like, I never thought I would get to a million subscribers. I, I thought I would cap at like 200,000 subscribers tops ever, like in my lifetime, because I'm like, this shit is just fucking weird. But when YouTube shows my stuff to new people, about 10% of them actually stay. I mean, I can look at the statistics. So if I have a video that does really well and YouTube like blasts it to, you know, a couple million people or whatever, I get lucky with the algorithm, 10 to 15% of people will like watch another video. Only 10 to 15%. If you think about like a classroom or whatever, like a 10 to 15% grade is abysmally failing. If you think about like a blockbuster movie or something, if only 10 to 15% of people like it, like that movie would tank and be terrible and be considered a failure. So most people leave, but the 10% of people who do like my stuff really fucking like it and they can't get it anywhere else. My channel is fairly unique. The sort of style and creative like way I have of making things, which we'll talk about later in this video of how I have developed this particular creative style is intentionally weird and niche and this just strange combination of things that I think is incredibly hard to replicate. And frankly, there's a lot of people I see, uh, people reach out to me and be like, hey, can I try my own variation of one of your ideas? And I'm like, yeah, dude, that's fine. Like, cause what makes my stuff my own is the specific creative mix that that fusion restaurant that I have honed, not just like one little piece of it. So I don't think it you can I don't think you can recreate what I'm doing. I don't think it's replaceable. And so again, even though 90% of people don't love what I'm doing when it's shown to just a broad audience, the 10% of people who do actually like it stick around. And that has led to my audience and my views going up over time because whenever people do find it and really love it, they stick around because I'm creating something they cannot get elsewhere. So this is how I'm gonna define great content in this video. It is something that is irreplaceable. It is something that when a person finds it and they happen to be the type of person, not everybody's going to, you know, more than 90% of people in the world will probably not like what you're doing. But if they're the type of person who does happen to really love what you're doing, that they stick around because they can't get it elsewhere. That is what makes it great. Okay, so if you're on board with this so far, that making just like good, decent stuff is not enough, you will never grow any audience, they will keep going to Five Guys, and instead you have to make your own fusion restaurant. Um, well, so obviously the goal now is to find the cuisines that you're going to mix. And I have a system for doing this. You don't need to just pick these randomly. You don't just have to be like, yeah, I'm gonna be like a stand-up comic and like a carpenter and I'll make funny homes. No, 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 We're, we have to build uh, the fusion restaurant and pick the two genres that you as an individual are going to succeed at. This next little section is the part that if I said this on Twitch, everybody would spam the like the shocked face um, because I have a, a hard truth for you. Life is not a Disney movie. You cannot do anything you set your mind to. That's just not true. You cannot be the best basketball player in the world, okay? That's reserved for LeBron James or, you know, the other 10 people who can be the best basketball player in the world. It does not matter how much heart you give it and the power of friendship and belief and if coach from your high school, like, teaches you the meaning of Christmas. It, it doesn't fucking matter, okay? LeBron James is an absolute freak of nature athlete and has the kind of intelligence to and focus to work hard, be perseverant, be smart on the basketball court. You do not have those two things, okay? You, you don't. And it doesn't matter how hard you work. You will never have those two things. This is actually, it was kind of hard for me to, it took me a long time to realize this. I think we're told a lot in media of like, yeah, do whatever you want. But it's like, no, no, no. You're actually not talented at everything in the world. And just like LeBron James is really, really fucking good at being a basketball player, he would not be a great chef. He's never going to be the best chef in the world because everybody has specific skill sets that they are great at. For this video, I am going to call them skill sets. And my theory that I still believe is that everybody has two. You have two things, two categories of tasks or skills that, that you as a human being, that every human being is great at. In this category, these are the types of things that when you do them in your own life, they feel effortless. They feel energizing. It feels like it's obvious what to do next. Like it's so clear what you should be doing with this task. You can improve at it faster and quicker. You are not like moldable clay, okay? You don't come into the world as this like shapeless being and you can kind of craft yourself into whatever you want. No, 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 we're, we're born with two skill sets. There's two things you're fucking awesome at. Those are your weapons and those don't change. And I think life gets a lot more efficient and successful when you recognize that and you say, oh shit, 
I'm actually like mediocre at almost everything, but there's two things I'm really fucking good at and I'm just gonna focus on those. And when you do that, life just like accelerates. To talk about my own uh, experience with this again, Again, I didn't realize this when I was young. And so in high school, as a quick example, I did music production. I like made a lot of music. I downloaded Fruity Loops and I made all the stuff on the Newgrounds audio portal. And I worked so fucking hard at making music. It was like my thing. It was my idea. I identified myself as like a musician. And no matter how hard I worked at making music, everybody else on the Newgrounds audio portal, like people my age who were making music were way fucking better. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of people like me who were making like mediocre stuff. And then a few guys who just seemed to blow it out of the park every time. There was one time they did like a competition where it was like a 24 hour competition. Can you make a song in 24 hours? And I was like, okay, this is my chance. Like I'm, I'm gonna take the whole weekend. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go fucking crazy on this. And I worked super hard and I made one of my best songs ever. And one of these other guys who was super talented on the, on the, it's like a forum basically, who was on this forum, he like made a post. He was like, oh my God, I forgot about this until three hours before, but I managed to crank this out. And it is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. I, I still have it saved. And I remember that moment of being like, what the fuck? I worked so goddamn hard and my thing doesn't, I mean, it's fine. It was good. It was a good piece of music. People listened to it and were like, oh, that's good. That's good. But with his, it felt special and unique. And I was just like, why can't I get anywhere near this guy no matter how hard I worked? That was always really frustrating for me. And I, I did music kind of casually for a number of years and, and always found like I was just like hitting a brick wall with it despite a huge amount of work. And then when I was 23 or four, I think four, when I was 24, I was like, hey, I wanna try making like videos about Hearthstone, that seems fun. And I, uh, I picked up video editing. I had never done any video editing of any kind ever and uh, learned Premiere from this online tutorial. And I distinctly remember that moment when I was learning, I mean, it was over like two weeks, I learned how to edit videos and every night I would watch these tutorials and everything I was learning, it was like my brain was like electrified. I was, it felt like, this makes complete sense. With the music production stuff, it was like, the analogy I use is with music production, it was like I was sitting in a kitchen and there's a whole bunch of ingredients on uh, just on the counter. You got flour and sugar and you've got fruit and, and spices and all this stuff, right? I meet all these ingredients, but I had no fucking idea what to do with them. And this is, uh, this is also how I would actually cook. I don't know how to cook at all. And I was like looking at these ingredients as a musician and being like, okay, well maybe, I don't know, I'll throw on a pineapple and we'll put in like that chicken thing and we'll put in this syrup. I don't know. And you just try shit, you throw it in a bowl and it tastes bad most of the time. But if you throw enough stuff into a bowl, then eventually something tastes okay. That was the process with music. The instant I started video editing, it was like, I wasn't looking at ingredients anymore. I could see all the potential meals. Like you could see the comedy, you could understand, ah, that's why that thing would be there. I get what the value that would have in a dish. And wait, that because of that fruit or that spice being in this thing and this piece of bread or whatever being in this type of format, these would combine in this particular way. As I was learning editing, I was shocked by how obvious everything felt. It felt like I could see, not into the future, but like see the possibilities and was energized by everything. It was, it was obvious to me in a way that music was obscured and, and unclear and I was just kind of stabbing in the dark until something kind of came together. This was a massive epiphany because I was like, oh, that's what was going on with music. That's what was fucking going on. The guys who were just incredible and in blowing it out of the water, they were like me with editing. They had that gift to just like see the possibilities to push it in directions with less effort. And no matter how hard I would have worked at music, I never would have beaten those guys because they had the natural skill set in that category. So this is a this is a massively important thing to recognize when it comes to creativity. In a lot of areas of our lives, you can get by with just hard work. I think anybody can be good at anything with hard work. You can, if you want, if your dream is to become an NBA player, you can become a very good basketball player if you work your fucking ass off. But again, you're not going to beat LeBron James, who is great, right? Who has that skill set, the two skill sets that are like unmatched, right? Unless you have those skill sets, you are not going to be at his level. But with creativity, right? Because what we've talked about, how being great and really standing out is super important. That's why focusing on your skill sets is super 
super critical to making great content. To again, this overall goal of this entire video is how do you make great content that people fucking love. Now, as I said before, I believe that everybody has two skill sets. I should give the disclaimer, uh, most of what I'm saying in this video is not like brand new ideas. It's just synthesized. Oh, it's a whole bunch of different ideas I've heard over the years that are synthesized in a particular way for content creation. This, this two skill sets thing, I haven't heard other people talk about it specifically in this way, but I believe everybody's got two skill sets. So you have two categories of skills that you are great at and everything else is just decent. It could literally be anything, right? It could be like parodying things, teaching, creating a comfortable social environment, like the way you socialize with people improv, whether that's comedy or drama, or whatever else, organization or communicating ideas. You could have athletic talent and maybe it's writing stories. Maybe it's analyzing popular trends. Maybe it's how to market things. Maybe it's building a team environment or building a business, right? There's uh, many, 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 many different skills in the world. And I think you have two of them. And as I've kind of teased, I think the best content is a mix of two skill sets. It is a is when a person combines two things that they are incredibly talented at into a skill mix. That's the term I'm going to use for this video. So you have your two skill sets that I think everybody has when you combine them together, which is what you have to do for creativity. That is your skill mix. What's really cool about this, and this is what I did. I did this exercise when I first uh, came up with these ideas. Um, you can look at and I think you should do this. Go look at all the content that you like, whether it's books, TV shows, streamers, whatever. Right. It's always a mix of like two themes or two kind of core ideas that intertwine. And it's the combination of those two things that makes it so good and intriguing, right? Some examples off the, and of course, these examples aren't necessarily things that you like, but I'm describing why other people find them so appealing, right? Which is the important thing for game of Thrones, right? It's this incredibly rich, evocative world building, uh, and character building, but also the tension of this betrayal, sadness, death. There's this like darkness to it that makes the world building feel much more visceral, or at least that's my interpretation of Game of Thrones. Bojack Horseman, uh, I think a phenomenal TV show. It's this witty parody of pop culture, like this incredible kind of analysis of our current modern day culture, as well, in, you know, with, it's very, with a lot of humor mixed in, as well as this really like accurate kind of dark portrayal of human emotion and struggle. And again, I think it's the combo of those two things that makes it so potent. Something that's more niche, the Adventure Zone Dungeons and Dragons podcast by the McElroy brothers. You probably have not heard of this. It's not like wildly popular, but it's these three brothers who do, uh, who do a podcast, or three brothers and their dad who do a podcast. It's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. And I think what makes it work so well is those three have just insane, hilarious improv comedy, which on itself is really, really great. But then they also combine it with like custom fantasy worlds and characters and stories. And it is the combination of those two things, seeing their improv and jokes go up against, you know, like goblins trying to sell them like merchandise and whatever. And these moments that happen as a result of this combination, which is what makes it so incredibly memorable and lovable and funny. Um, interestingly with them, I think it's a good example because those guys have a podcast called my brother, my brother and me, which is just improv comedy. It doesn't have that kind of second piece of combining it with the fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons. And in my, in my eyes, I don't, I, I'm not drawn to the improv, uh, podcast at all. A lot of people like it, but that podcast is only doing one thing, right? It's just doing the improv. And for me and for many other people, once they combined the two things together, that's when it really resonated and felt unique. You can do this with any streamer or YouTuber or book or movie you like. I'm not going to do it with streamers and YouTubers because I just don't want to talk about other people's uh, work necessarily. And people change that might become kind of more outdated. But again, I did this. I sat down to this for like a day with everything that I liked. And it really helps you see the pattern of, oh, yeah, this, these people who are doing the things that I absolutely fucking love they kind of have a mix of two things that are they're like ultra great at. And conversely, the content creators, if you think about some of maybe creators who you used to like, who aren't doing so well anymore on YouTube and Twitch or wherever, or they just haven't grown in a long time. If you look at what they're doing, I think usually you see they are no longer combining two things together that really feel distinct and mix in some sort of compelling way. They are now just kind of going through the motions of one of their two skill sets. And that's enough to keep their audience, but it's not going to grow the audience. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, I believe most people only use zero or one of their skill sets in their daily life. You know, a lot of people don't get the opportunity to use both of their things. Um, you know, my two skill sets, which I'll talk about in a little bit, are creating custom goals, like creating silly goals to pursue 
and storytelling. <laughs> and the odds that if if I if you just drop me in a random job, like I worked at EA as a programmer, if you drop me into the EA programming job, the idea that I'm going to like have those two skill sets be relevant, like silly goals and storytelling in an, in like a programming where you're programming phone apps, like that job was not crafted for me to like really succeed at my two skill sets. I think most people in the world, you know, unless you've really deliberately pursued this or done this thoughtfully, often end up in environments where it's like, yeah, they're just kind of going through the motions. And again, they can work hard and do a good job. But they're probably not like really leaning into the two things that they are like super great and super energized by. But with content creation, right? If you are watching this video and you are gonna be a content creator, you can create whatever you want. That's the whole point. And so you can design your work and your strategy uh, entirely around your two skill sets, your two strengths, and making it a combination of those two things. If you do that and you combine your skill sets, you, you can create a niche genre and you're going to be naturally better and faster in that genre because it's built entirely on the things that you are super gifted and good at. Not only that, if you build content in that niche genre, it is irreplaceable because only somebody with those two specific skill sets can actually make what you're making. It can't be imitated otherwise, and it's almost impossible for people to have the exact two same skill sets. So you basically unlock this incredible opportunity if you can find your two skill sets, you put, it, put them together and you're like, okay, here's my skill mix, and you design your content around that. That is the goal. We gotta find your two skill sets, we gotta find your two cuisines that you're gonna make a fusion restaurant out of and we're gonna combine them together. Again, as a quick, you know, relating this to, to my own journey, I think my content, as I've talked about, was good before uh, before I kind of found my skill mix. So I did music, like I said, in high school. In 2015, I started making Hearthstone content for anybody who was around back then. So I did like Hearthstone comedy videos or like esports recaps. And in the years after that, I tried a whole bunch of different other things um, like let's play videos or, you know, like highlights of me and my friends joking around playing PUBG or like a comedy podcast with my friends. Basically up until 2018, when I sort of started the one year program that we'll talk about, um, I was imitating the other hamburger restaurants. I didn't really have a clear focus on what I was great at. I was essentially looking at all the other hamburgers in the market and saying, okay, well, maybe I could be good at that. Okay, well, maybe I could be good at that. And I mean, I distinctly remember, I would like look at some of what the McElroy's, who I really, really love, I would look at some of the videos that they would do and I'd be like, okay, maybe I could do that. And I would try to imitate it, right? And I would do my best to imitate it. I would work really hard and it would be good. It would be good. It's not like terrible, but it didn't feel particularly unique. It didn't feel particularly great. And it was hard for me to make, it was exhausting, right? I'm like working super hard on something that doesn't feel natural uh, naturally energizing and clear and obvious to me. So then in 2018, I sort of came up with this idea, this, uh, of skill sets. And, and again, people have talked a lot about like finding your strengths for me. I think what it helped me to narrow it down to just two and to really focus on just two. And I think that has made it a lot easier rather than pretending like you might have like lots of skill sets. You just have to discover No, I think you have two. Um, but I came across my two skill sets and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about how to find your own in a little bit. But for me, I, I went through this exercise and I realized, okay, there's two things that I really fucking love in my life that I think I'm really, really, really great at. One is to create fun goals. If you've seen my Twitch or YouTube, you are probably familiar with this. I, my brain just spits out shit to do all the time. If I play a video game, my brain is going to be yelling like, wait, wait, what if you stop doing what you're supposed to do? And then we like set up a cart race and we go like run across the thing. Like if we're playing PUBG, I'm like, wait, wait, let's stop playing PUBG and let's go have a cart race like Mario Kart through the wilderness. If I'm playing World of Warcraft, I'm like, wait, wait, let's like do a thing where we jump off a cliff and try to land in the water right? It, whatever it is, like uh, I can come up in, in, with an infinite number of just like fun goals to do. And I think they also have the, the trait that other people can be involved with them. It's not an accident that on my Twitch stream, for example, I have people be involved, right? That I have Twitch chat play a part in what's going on. I think that's part of that skill set. So creating fun goals, that, that was one skill set of mine that I realized. And the other is storytelling, kind of teaching as well. I think teaching is a part of storytelling, but storytelling creating fun goals and storytelling. I realized, holy shit, these are the things I fucking love to do throughout my entire life. I have created dumb little goals and pursued those. That's how I've connected with friends. That's how I've played video games. That's how I've like, I think when I've been at my most creative in terms of making little things that people care about and then teaching and storytelling, like 
I love to tell stories. I love to explain things. I like using weird analogies. I like using music. I like writing emails just because it's an opportunity to like explain what's going on in a coherent way. Whenever I had done Hearthstone videos, like when I had done YouTube videos so far, the ones that I had really loved to do was when there was like, a, you know, I, I recorded something and then there was like a story I got to kind of like form out of that. And that's what really resonated with me. So these are these two things that I suddenly found after, you know, 28 years. Yeah, to, or 27, 28, 28, 27. I think I was 27. Yes, I was 27. So after 27 years of my creative work, just kind of being this like shot in the dark, just pow, 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 like firing in random places. I was like, oh, these are the two things. I fucking love doing these two things. So what was next? At first I was like, okay, well I got these two things. Maybe I'll try like doing this one for a little while. And I did them separately. So this is the beginning of 2018 for me. I, uh, I was making a video every week and I was like, okay, why don't I just do like a gaming challenge? You know, I come up with a dumb goal in Breath of the Wild and I like do the goal. And I just like show the recording of the goal happening. You know, I like jump off a cliff and I land on a horse at the bottom. That's funny. That's like a fun challenge. I'll like, I'll throw, I'll show the victory moment or I'll be like, I'll play these challenges with my friends, right? Like, well, I'll come up with a dumb goal and then we'll all play it together. So that was like some of the videos I was making were just that. And then other ones I was like, okay, how could I do the storytelling side? Okay, I could like try to explain. I did like commentary of speed runs where I was like, okay, I could try to like tell the story of what's happening in a speed run. I tried some explained with food, like the early, some early versions that, that didn't come out uh, on YouTube ever, but like of just like, okay, what if I'm just explaining things? Both of these had potential and I think they were good. And again, I enjoyed a lot of what I was doing. But then it was like, wait, what if I combine these? It sounds obvious in retrospect. But at the time, nobody was make, nobody was like playing video games. Lots of people were playing video games in dumb ways. Lots of people were telling stories. But nobody was doing inane, pointless, stupid goals in video games and then like teaching you how to do it. Like putting a lot of time and effort and production value into like telling a great story about how you achieved a completely pointless, useless goal, right? So the combination of those two things, nobody was doing that at that time. I think it's become kind of more popular, a lot more popular now. But in 2018, I remember scouring YouTube and be like, nobody, nobody is doing this. But I was like, okay, well, but I could, right? I could, I could do a dumb thing. And then I could like tell the story. And like, that sounds, I mean, that sounds super stupid, <laughs> but like, it could be great. Like, like I, that sounds fun to me. And I put them together and I believe the first one I ever did was either Mario Bros with voice commands, but I think it was World of Warcraft skydiving, which is on my channel. And I'd recorded this with a friend and it had just been like a fun time we, we did together. It was a good time. And I was like, okay, what if I change the approach to like, I am teaching you how to do this dumb thing in World of Warcraft. And just like instantly, I was like, holy shit, this is it. It got so much more interesting. All of a sudden it felt way more creative because instead of one of my two kind of like creative, you know, strengths being there, both of them were combining and the combination of them felt just like weird. And you, I mean, again, my, my stuff is fucking weird. It is super bizarre and pointless and dumb. And even though it's like a little, I don't want to say mainstream now, it's been very popular now, like, especially in 2018, I was like, what the fuck is this? I was like, but I love this. It, it really feels it, like adding new ideas into it was incredibly easy. As I made that video, like I could write new voice lines effortlessly. I could come up with new ideas, new music effortlessly, because again, it was using both of the skill sets that I really love. It was way faster to make. That was a super weird thing. My old Hearthstone videos used to take me like 40 hours to make like three minutes of content because I was just like grinding on it, trying to make it better, even though I was kind of resisting my natural strengths. With this, it was like, well, it was easy. It's obvious what I should do kind of at each point. It's obvious the things I should try or what I could try. And maybe the most important, it was more fun. It was a lot more fun to make a video where it was like all I was doing was using the two things that I love to do and that's it. And I wasn't going like, yeah, well now I need to like do a lot of graphics and I need to edit it in the way that guy does. I was like, no, 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 I'm just doing the things I have fun with. And so it felt more sustainable and more energizing. What was also interesting is once I did this, I, I combined these two things and I was like, whoa, I'm teach, I'm storytelling dumb gaming challenges. Other people's react, like my friends, when I would show them stuff, their reactions to what I was doing suddenly shifted. Again, I'd been making videos that had one of those two things before and people hadn't like really responded to it, but suddenly I was getting feedback like, oh, this feels really unique. This feels really creative. And one of the, one of the most, I think, important pieces of feedback I got from people was this feels like you. 
this feels like a video that represents you and your creative voice. And I was like, holy shit. And, you know, this is like close friends who knew what I was really like. And they felt like, wow, this really feels like the expression of the best parts of you. That was the huge moment of figuring out this skill mix. And I, I now design everything with that. I try as often as I can to always be cognizant of that and always have that be the goal with what I'm doing. It's not a coincidence at all that every single stream and video and thing I do, for, at least with public content creation, uh, with, I mean, a couple very, very few exceptions, almost every single thing is like, there's a goal. There's a, there's a thing I'm trying to achieve. There's something we are trying to do. That's what I get energized by, right? That's why I'm able to stream at this like high energy for long periods of time, because I'm doing the thing I really, really care about. It's also why I don't just get on and like, stream Kingdom Hearts or stream Valorant, right? I, there's lots of people for whom they love doing that. For me, that doesn't do anything, right? So I always make sure that it has like the fun goal of some kind that I've created that I'm excited about. And then there's an emphasis on storytelling. And storytelling for me is like, you know, really outlining what we're trying to do and setting the tone of what we're trying to do, setting like being clear about the progress towards that thing, using music. Music is like a huge part of, of my like storytelling style, right? So it's not an accident that I'm playing music all the time in my Twitch streams or my YouTube videos. To me, those are how I tell the story well. Using voiceover, the way we pace things with the music, there's a lot of thought on how to tell the best story. And it's the combination of those two things that I, th I think is what makes uh, my content interesting. I discovered this in the middle of 2018. Um, again, up to that point, I had not succeeded uh, on YouTube. I had had some success on like Reddit, but there was no like sustainable audience. I was getting about a thousand views per video. Um, and I, I shifted to this new style of my skill mix. I did this for uh, five, I quit my job, did it for five months, was burning through all my savings. And a little over five months after that, uh, the channel blew up. I went from uh, like 10,000 subs to 100,000 in a week and everything just became successful ever since. So discovering the skill mix, shifting my focus to it, and then working really hard on making it the best that it can be, which is, you know, another big step we're going to talk about. That's what allowed me to succeed. And I strongly believe that if, if I had not made that pivot, if I had not recognized what was going on here and, and shifted everything to go all in on these two skills, that I never would have had this breakthrough. I never would have created a channel or creative products that people really love that when they found it, they went, I need to stay here because I can't get this anywhere else. I think I could have made a lot of stuff that was good and I did. And I could have made a lot of stuff that people were like, oh, this is great. And then they move on to something else after they watch it. Um, but this was the pivotal moment in growing an audience and for things to be more fun and just to do a better job. Anyway, it's just all better. It's all better. Okay. So uh, hopefully you're convinced on everything I'm saying. If you are, let's uh, let's talk about how you can find your skill sets. So here, here's the process I used. I think it worked really great. <clears throat> There's a couple steps. First, I want you to and do this on a piece of paper or a document or whatever. Write down everything that you enjoy or that you're good at. Literally go through your entire life, okay? Go through your childhood, go through school, go through work, every job you've had, the relationships you've had, the friendships you've had, the hobbies you have, everything. Think through everything in your life and write down all the things you've really enjoyed. Be specific, okay? Don't just say like, I like going to concerts. What kind of concerts do you like going to? What, what do you do there? Like, who are you with? What is like, What specifically about that do you like, right? Or, or do you do that you, that you really enjoy? Don't say writing emails. Like I, I, for example, was like, you know what? When I'm at my job, it's, I actually really enjoy the chance to write emails to people. And I had to think more about it. And I was like, well, what do I actually like to, what, what kind of emails? I don't just love emails. I was like, okay, it's when I get to kind of communicate and explain what's going on and our goal with a particular show. This is like at my uh, producer job, like my esports job. So I was like, okay, it's, it's specifically when I'm kind of like outlining how this thing is going to work and why it's going to be compelling. Don't say, I like hanging out with friends. What do you like doing specifically? What kind of social dynamic? Like uh, what specifically are you doing? Don't just say video games. Uh, if you like video games, that's great. What specific games? What do you like to do in the games? Be specific. That's step one. Once you've got a big list of, you know, hopefully 20, 30, 50 things that you really, really like to do, now under each one, write down why you enjoy those things. Um, you kind of maybe already did this a little bit, but you want to, for each one of those, you know, if you're like, hey, I like going to concerts with my friends and we hang out at the back talking while listening to the music in the back. Now you write under that why you love that. Like try to really identify what about that feels energizing to you. Let's say you like writing, you know, short stories, okay? What specifically about writing the thing that you've identified makes you excited and enjoy it and feel enthusiastic about it? Once you've done that, you now have a list 
of all the things that you love, right? Uh, initially, it was like the things you like to do, but now it's like, what do you just love in general? Like, what what excites you? What thematic things get you going and energize you? So take this list of why you enjoy things and now try to categorize it into two groups. Again, not the specific things you do, but like why you enjoy things. Take those and now start trying to categorize them. There's probably gonna be a couple in here that are that are obvious, right? If, if, if one of them is like emailing people to do it for me, it was like emailing people and explaining what's going on. And then another was like talking to my parents and explaining technology concepts. Like, okay, those, those are kind of like similar, right? And then it would be like, okay, I have one that was, you know, uh, I always create weird goals with my coworkers in an office. I'll like create little activities and fun things for us to do together as coworkers to bond. Okay, and then in, in video games, I like to create a dumb little goal for me and my friends to do. Okay, those kind of move together. Some might not be as obvious, but you know, try messing around with it, try to group them together and try to look for the common themes. It'll probably take a little bit of experimentation, but eventually, I believe, you will find two really common patterns that represent the things that you love. You will have two groups which represent a whole bunch of different experiences in your life that you have really enjoyed and why you enjoyed those experiences. And that group represents your skill set. These two groups represent your skill sets and together they represent your skill mix. For me, there was all these things that that seemed uh, like, you know, disconnected when I was writing them down. I was like, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I we would like invent little games in my garage with whatever, you know, like sports equipment we had around. We would make stuff up. Oh yeah, in college, I liked to like invent drinking games with my friends. We would just like do some dumb activity. You know, like on the other side of storytelling, like writing emails and editing videos didn't feel connected at first, right? But as I continued to sort of group them, I realized, wait, no, thematically I'm doing the same thing. It's about telling a, a story. It's about communicating an idea in a clear way or like teaching. Once you kind of write them out and, and see them all in paper, I think it becomes more obvious. Like, oh yeah, I do really like this. And as weird as it might sound, I was 27 and I was like, oh, I really fucking like teaching and telling stories. I had never consciously realized that. Once I looked back, I was like, Oh yeah, I can think of like a I can think of like a hundred instances where that was the case, but but when until I did this, I would not have thought of myself as like a storyteller. And after this, I was like, wait, that is clearly what I'm doing. So it, it, for you, this might not be as like revolutionary, but for me, and I think for a lot of people, there, this might identify a big area in your life. Where you're like, oh yeah, I've I always enjoyed that. I could really focus on this thing. I really can understand it more clearly. And it's important to realize these aren't narrow, right? It's not like, you know, storytelling might, for you, it might come up of like, I'm sitting there narrating a thing like I'm doing right now. But no, like storytelling for me included all these other things. It was like, oh yeah, I liked to play music when hanging out with my friends in order to like set the, set, like to set the fun tone for what we were doing. The point though, is that it needs to encompass specifically what you are great at. And it's important to remember, unfortunately, it's not what you want to be great at. Uh, for me, this was hard to accept. I really wish that I had in that list, like super awesome at hanging out with people and is like really comfortable socially and is just like, everybody loves me, but that's not, that's not true. And those are, those are, that's not what came up when I was really honest with myself and said, Hey, what, what have I really loved to do? What has made me feel awesome? Like, no, as much as I wish I was like the ultra social, like party animal guy, I'm not. Same thing with being funny. You know, like I love the idea of being a super funny guy who can tell jokes and crack, you know, funny things all the time, but that's not what I love to do. That when I was honest with myself, like, hey, what do I really love? I don't love like making people laugh. That's not something that like brings me inherent joy. I think a lot of humor can come from the way that I tell stories or the dumb goals that I come up with. But just in and of itself, like being funny, that wasn't there. And I it was it was kind of sad to like cross that from the list and be like, no, that's that's not actually who I am. Um, but this is really, really important for this to work. It's this if, if you approach this as like, yeah, here's how I'm going to convince myself that I am really awesome and funny. Like, no, it's not the whole point is to say, okay, here are the, the, all the things in the world that I'm not going to do. We're ignoring all of those. We're just focusing on these two specific things I am great at. That's the whole value of this because once you do that, you unlock this incredible potential because you're not obsessed over the things that you are not 
naturally gifted at. Another note here is that uh, if you try this and you feel like you don't have two skill sets, maybe you're like, I really, it doesn't seem like there's two things that I really love, that I'm really great at, that I just feel, you know, like I can succeed at, that energize me. If you don't feel that way, you, you probably need to, to try new things. You just got to try new things. You know, again, I did this when I was 27. And at that point, I'd had a bunch of jobs, had tried creative things, a lot of different life experiences. For whatever reason, if you feel that way, I think you should go try new things. Go try some new hobbies. Try a new hobby every month and then see how it makes you feel. Switch jobs. Quit your job and go do a new one. You can quote me on that. Probably don't do that. But try something different at your job, right? Uh, try a new relationship. Make new friends. Um, this is also a good time to imitate other people. So if you're, you know, creatively, if you if you don't feel like you understand what you love to do, try imitating some other people, right? Like go, to, go back into the food court and imitate five guys. And that's okay as long as your goal is not to grow an audience. If your goal is to learn what you like to do, you can imitate five guys and be like, okay, did I enjoy that? Like what piece of that? In the same way I did with music where I looked back on it and I was like, I didn't love to do that really, but there was a few very specific pieces of that that I did enjoy. And those, those eventually kind of moved over into the storytelling skill set. I realized much later on, like I really wasn't good with most of that stuff. But there was a few pieces in there that I did like. And I bet if I had just focused entirely on those, I could have been uh, better at music. But hopefully at this point, um, if you've done this exercise or, or thought about it or whatever, you now have your two skill sets. Congratulations. Now, now what do you do? So now is where the work begins. We are now into the final section of this video, which is the one year plan. Actually, I'm gonna use the voice changer, hold on. The one year plan. It, it's not as ominous as I m made it sound, but so, so at this point, right, you have decided the fusion restaurant that you're going to make. For me, it was creating goals, like creating silly goals and storytelling. So I was like, okay, those are my two cuisines. I'm going to make a fusion restaurant that, that fuses those two things together. You have come up with your two things. I don't know what they are. It doesn't matter. Again, the point of this video is not about what specifically, you know, you should do. It doesn't matter what platform you do any of this shit on. It doesn't matter. What matters is you find your creative two skills. And now we're going to combine them. But as you, as you might think, let's say you actually went out into the world, right? Let's say you're like, okay, I'm fucking awesome at Mexican food and Italian food. I'm going to make an Ita Mexican Italian fusion restaurant. But you haven't, you haven't cooked in your life. Okay. <laughs> like, if you, if you're like a, a brand new chef and you've never cooked in your life, even if you identify that you are naturally gifted at Mexican food and Italian food, you're still going to have to do a bunch of work to learn how to cook to learn what to cook specifically that is the best tasting in this new fusion restaurant that you've created. This is particularly tough because they might seem incompatible. You might be like Mexican and Italian, or again, whatever your two skill sets are, Mexican and Italian, these don't make any sense at all. And you're not gonna have an example to like look out into the world and be like, okay, well that, that guy did it successfully, so I know this will work. Because the whole point is that that hasn't happened, right? The whole point of this is to come up with a with a fusion genre restaurant that other people aren't doing. So it is it is the blessing and the curse of this thing. The, the blessing is that you're creating something that's going to be great and unique, and when people find it, they don't have something else that feels similar, and so they're gonna stick around with you because they love what you're doing. That's the blessing, but the curse is you don't have other examples to go off of. You don't have a person who you can look at and be like, okay, I know what works and what doesn't, because again, the whole point is you don't know what specifically is gonna work about this because nobody else is doing it. Another way to think about this is like you've, created the restaurant, you know the two genres, but you haven't defined the menu yet. Um, and this is assuming you're a new content creator. If you have done a lot of content before, maybe you already have an idea, like you've already done a bunch of cooking, you have a general sense of things, and you just need to refine it. But if you're like pretty new at content creation, this is where you are. You're a brand new chef. You know the two genres. You just need to start cooking shit, right? Again, for me, it was like I when I came on this idea, I was like, okay, I am going to make dumb gaming challenges, and I'm going to do storytelling. What, like, how though? What do I do? Like, what specifically do I do? Well, the only way to learn what tastes good is by cooking new things. Emphasis on new. Repeating something does not teach you anything, okay? If you make a grilled cheese sandwich, and that I guess that's not Mexican or Italian, but whatever. If you make a grilled cheese sandwich, and it's okay, it's fine, and then you just make the exact same grilled cheese sandwich the same way every day, you are not going to learn anything, okay? And just reading recipes also will not teach you. You cannot become a great chef if you sit around reading recipes all day. You can't. Ask any chef or cook in the world. You've got to cook stuff. But if you try making a new dish, 
then you do learn something. You always learn something if you try something new. That is like the fundamental principle here. It is absolutely a, a true thing with creativity. If you try a new thing, you will learn something from it, whether it succeeds or fails. So, the one-year plan. The one-year plan is to create one finished piece of content using your skill mix that includes one new ingredient every week for one year. That's it. One video or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a video. If you're doing crochet, that's fine. Do crochet. If you're doing TikToks, that's fine. But you have to make one every single week. It has to be finished. It has to use your skill mix, right? It combines the two skills that we've identified. Like it's fundamentally about those two things being combined and it has to include one new ingredient. And you do this every week for one year. For me, that meant when I was, because again, I did this in 2018. This is the program that I did that I credit with the, with the success of, of my YouTube channel and becoming a successful YouTuber. Um, when I did this in 2018, I did it every, every single week for a year. And every week I had to make a video that was uh, mixing uh, some stupid goal, like a goal that I've come up with and storytelling. And the new ingredient means something new creatively that you have not done before. Just something new, that's it, okay? And that could be, maybe it's a different game, maybe it's a different graphic, the way you like visualize things, maybe it's a use of music, the way you narrate stuff, the pacing of the editing, uh, if it's a collaborative with something else, there are infinite creative possibilities in the world, right? But you have to try something new. So again, to, to break down the, the new ingredient part, cooking with new ingredients is where improvement happens. If your goal is to make is to come up with a menu for your restaurant that fucking bangs ass, right? That people are like, holy shit, this is awesome. You have to improve as a chef. And the way you do that is by cooking with new ingredients. It proves what does or does not work. When you cook a thing with a new ingredient, you can say, okay, this ingredient does or does not make my dishes taste better. Using it in this way does or does not make my dishes taste better. You learn something. Again, just cooking the same thing does not actually improve you. There's this weird, dumb mentality out there, which I used to fall victim to. There's this weird mentality about like grind. You gotta like do the grind. You'll see like Twitch streamers talk about like, yeah, like nobody's watching my Twitch stream, but I'm grinding it out every day. But they're just doing the same fucking thing. Of course, you're if you aren't trying anything new, why would your stuff get better ever if you're not ever doing a new thing? Grinding doesn't do anything. Trying new stuff and reflecting on whether it works is how you improve. It's also hard. Right, it's scary and hard, as we'll talk about in a little bit. But that's what makes it valuable. That's that's the whole fucking way you get better. So again, every week you are fit. This is the the plan. If you stick with it, and I really believe this will make you a great content creator. Every week you have to finish one video that combines your two skill sets. It is fundamentally a combination of your two skill sets, and it incorporates a creative idea that you haven't done before. Then after you finish it. You write down what you learned. You write down, hey, did this succeed or not? When you, Because you made a finished thing, right? And it had this new ingredient. You say, okay, how did the new ingredient work? You don't have to write a whole fucking essay, but just be like, okay, I tried this new type of music and I used it in this way and I edited it in this way. Did I enjoy that? Was it fun to make? And did I enjoy watching it afterwards? If you did, write why. Why did that work? If you didn't, write why. And you've now become a better cook. Notice that I did not say, oh, if if that new thing you tried worked really well, you succeeded. It's not about whether it like worked. It's you are learning what works and do what doesn't, right? Even if it fails, if you reflect on it and you say, okay, that didn't work, here's why, you learned something and you are a better chef. This is critically important because every single failure isn't a failure anymore. You got better every single week. Every single week in 2018, I tried a video and I tried a new thing and the vast majority sucked ass. And that was fine because I would reflect and go, okay, I tried just sitting there narrating like this over the thing and it felt weird. I didn't really like it. And I think it felt weird because of this. And next week I'm gonna try presenting my own narration in a different way. Even when you fail, you learn things that will lead into new things and that will lead into new experiments. And you will, you will become better as a content creator so much fucking faster by constantly trying new things and reflecting on them versus just grinding it out. It, some important notes on this again is, is you do you need to finish the thing. Uh, it's very common for new content creators or new creators of any kind, as, as you can read about, 
to just not finish stuff. But finishing stuff is where you learn the most. I, I think it's tempting to start a thing and you're like, eh, I'm kind of losing momentum. But if you just let yourself like get derailed every time things are hard, you will never push through to learn what works. You have to actually finish the thing. That is the hard part. This is also where you can try imitating other ideas. This is where you can say, okay, I have my weird genre. I'm gonna, I like one of the things that Five Guys does. Five Guys does. You know, they give people peanuts and let them throw them on the floor or whatever. Like, I'm gonna try that. But again, in the context of my skill mix. So now you can kind of take in little bits and pieces from all over. You can, you, cause you definitely want to like watch other people and be inspired, right? But instead of watching other people's stuff and saying, how do I copy what they're doing? How do I try to be as good as them? You're saying, I really like this one element of what they're doing. I'm gonna pluck it out put it into my skill mix. That's going to be my experiment this week. I'm going to see how it feels. I'm going to reflect on how it feels. And maybe you just learned a piece that is going to make your skill mix even better, going to make your menu even tastier. Or maybe you learned, hey, that thing doesn't work, but you're going to learn, okay, those are the types of things that don't work. And it becomes clearer what does work and gives you new ideas to try the next week. So hopefully you're convinced on why you have to try something new every week. Here's the, here's the reasoning for one year, why I think a one year commitment of doing this, again, weekly content with a new thing every week, Week for a full year is important. It's for a couple reasons. You cannot control when you find a great dish, okay? No person on earth, no creative on per person on earth can guarantee that something is gonna be awesome, okay? It doesn't matter, like think of whatever creator you think is the most brilliant person on earth, you, you, it doesn't matter. They cannot guarantee that their next piece of work is gonna be a fucking banger. The only thing you can control is the quantity of cooking. That's all you can do. You can show up and you can try a new thing and you can learn from it. And that's it. Creativity is is weird. It's very strange. There's this massive disconnect between what you think about a thing and what people are going to, uh, how people are going to respond to it. You can ask any creator about this. It, there's this very strange disconnect between how you think something will be received and how it is actually received. There's a very strange disconnect between how good of an idea you think something sounds and then how it actually feels once you make it. Creativity is this weird, unknowable thing that you cannot control. If you try to control it and think you're gonna control it, you're gonna be very disappointed and be miserable because you're gonna fail all the time. You kind of have to accept that all you can do is experiment, right? That's all you can do. You can show up every week and make a new thing that you can control. You cannot control how it tastes, unfortunately. I wish you could with content creation. You will get a little bit better at that as it goes on. I am better now after like eight years of making videos that when I have an idea to kind of think, hey, this will sort of probably work, but you still really don't. And there's so many ideas that I think are gonna be awesome bangers that aren't. And there's a lot of ideas that I think are gonna suck that become incredible. Literally my most popular video is Skyrim, but if I say dragons, then 10 dragons spawn, as well as the GTA 5 version of that. I was convinced that would be one of the worst streams I ever did. It would be 30 minutes and we would turn it off. And it turned into the most popular thing I've ever done. Same with most of the artificial intelligence stuff I've done, the Twitch stat, there's so many examples of that. And so the key to success is to show up and cook and finish a new thing with a new ingredient as many times as possible. Ultimately, that's the secret. The skill mix is, I think, critical to you focusing on cooking the right things. But even once you've found that direction, if you don't put in the fucking work and show up and make a new thing over and over and over and over and over, and you do this just hundreds of times, if you don't do that, you're never going to become a great chef. That is the key. And so the one year plan, sorry. The one year plan. The, the, the benefit of it is that you are committing to making a thing for a year. You're committing to, hold on, 52. Fi 52 weeks in a year, you are committing to 52 videos, okay? That is 52 attempts at greatness. The vast majority of people, and this is a, so important, the vast majority of people are gonna quit. Even if you're watching this video right now and you're feeling fucking inspired and you're like, oh my God, this is it. Like, I'm gonna do the thing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna grind it out. I'm gonna do this every week. The vast majority of people quit. This is the this is the hard thing. You you can't quit. You got to keep going because again, you can't control when you come up with the delicious dish. It does not matter how many recipes you read. It doesn't matter how many how much research you do. A lot of people sit around for months or years going like, yeah, one day I'm gonna become a YouTuber or, or a streamer, but I just gotta I just gotta like figure it out first. No, dude, no. The the way you figure it out is by cooking a lot. That's the only way you make progress, and you have to do it a lot to eventually get lucky and the stars align and the thing you make is fucking awesome. That's how you make great content. You show up and you try a bunch of new things. And most people quit within a few weeks or months because you don't get that immediate feedback. It takes a lot of time. Most of the things you make aren't gonna be great, especially early on when you're like struggling to figure out your creative styles. 
super discouraging. It's so hard at the beginning. But the commitment to one year is giving yourself an infinitely better chance at actually getting to the point where you you hit you get those hits, you hit those meals that are fucking great and amazing, right? The, the chance of that happening is a million percent higher if you commit for a full year than if you just do it for a couple weeks and quit. If you do it for a couple weeks or a couple months and then quit, it's almost certainly never going to happen. So the you have to have a long-term focus because otherwise you will not put in enough reps to eventually land in the, and get that exciting moment. This is how you create great content. You find your skill mix and you put in the work every week to make a new thing, to learn something to test something out that that where where you have now become better at making your skill mix menu and you keep doing that and your content is just going to get better and better and better and better and I guarantee you I promise that if you do this for a full year the quality of your work is going to be astronomically higher by the end than it was at the beginning and that was the case for me and I I promise it will be the case for you I can't promise you'll be a famous YouTuber by the end but the quality of your work and how much you improve will be so much higher let's talk about my journey again. So in January 2018, this is when I did the one year plan. I, I vowed on the first of, of that year, I was very frustrated by the lack of progress that I felt creatively in, in my life and just that I had never been able to really stick with something. So I said, every week this year, I'm going to record a video. It was very, very hard. I was working a very stressful, busy full time job, but I did this every single week, even when I really didn't want to, even when I was working 14 hour days, seven straight days, I stayed up at, you know, like 2 a.m. or whatever and recorded another video for an hour and a half because I promised myself I was going to do this every week. As I mentioned a little earlier, a couple months into the year, I came across the like skill mix idea and I was like, okay, instead of making these, I guess I was trying all these different video ideas and they weren't really landing. And I was like, wait, wait, what if I combine the two skills? And suddenly I was like, oh shit. Okay, this is the this is the vibe I want. And now I just need to try a bunch of different experiments to make this work. So I tested out to get to the point where Doug Doug as a channel like launched with my new videos. I spent months and months and months trying different narration style, like every week trying a new thing, different narration styles, different graphics, different pacing, different story structures, different jokes, different subplots, using music in different ways, trying different external tools like voice commands or mods or different editing techniques. And for 12 months for that whole year, I made weekly videos. I did not break a single week and I got way fucking better. Ironically, my channel actually did worse. <laughs> With every successive video, which I'll talk about a little bit later, that's one of the that's one of the fun parts of the content creation adventure. But uh, I basically persisted because I believed that this was valuable. I really believed. Like I, I quit my job in September and started posting videos every week, and I was like, I am going to do this until I run out of money, and then I'm going to take a part time job just enough so that I can still try to get a video out every week while getting you know while being able to like pay the bills, and I'm going to do this forever, and I will never quit. And um, it was very, very hard because not not because, you know, it's physically hard work, but because when every single week you create a new thing and nobody gives a shit at all and your views go down and, and nobody cares, um, it takes an immense amount of faith in yourself and in what you're doing to keep moving forward. And in my case, I had gone, I'd thought about all the stuff I've talked about. And I was looking at these videos that I was making and I could tell they needed a lot more. Like I could tell I had so much more improvement to do, but the core formula was, was there. The mix was there. I believed that this is something that people like me will love. That's what I believed. I believed there are people like me where they don't, they, there's nothing out there like this right now. Nobody is doing this weird fucking thing that I'm trying. Nobody's doing it. But I would love this shit if I found it. And I have to believe that there are other people out there who when they find my weird ass Mexican Italian restaurant that they're going to go, holy shit, this isn't like five guys. This isn't like anybody else. I love this shit. And there's not going to be a lot of people. Maybe it's only five or 10,000 people but that maybe is enough to live off of. And I just need to find those people. And I, and I believed in myself and it was, uh, it was, it was tough. It's tough to keep going when basically the rest of the world is telling you, we don't give a shit, but you have to be, you have to believe that there are people who care about what you're doing as much as you do. And exactly almost 12 months later, it was technically like 53 weeks after I started. It was like, cause it happened on my birthday. I think in January, the channel suddenly blew up after five months of putting out weekly videos, nobody giving a shit at all and just focusing on getting better. And I had gotten better and better and better that whole year. I had gotten better every single week. I had tried new shit and my, the skill that I was at by the end of that year was so fucking higher, so much higher than I started at the beginning. I had so much knowledge about what, what worked and what didn't. It wasn't just, Oh, these are the things that worked. I had tried a hundred things that didn't work. I knew what kind of things to avoid. I knew what pitfalls I could get into. I was so much better as a content creator, as a chef, 
my menu was fucking good. And there was still a lot of work to do. My menu was fucking good by the end of the year. And then it exploded. And suddenly overnight, I went from a thousand views a video to like 300,000 or something crazy. A couple videos had a couple million views and it just kept growing ever since then. And it's cool to be like, oh, Doug, you, you made it. But it's important to recognize like, if, if the channel had blown up after my very first video, I would not have been able to maintain or keep up the momentum, right? If like the first video I ever made like just exploded, like I had no real knowledge of what I was doing. I hadn't done hundreds of tests to see, okay, this does work, this doesn't work. I love this, I don't love this. This feels energizing, this doesn't feel energizing. But because I put in the 12 months of really deliberate focus on a new thing every week and learning, when my channel did explode, I had the skills and the knowledge to continue that growth and momentum. There's a lot of people out there who like get one viral video and then you never hear about them again. You don't wanna be that person. You wanna be the person who has put in the fucking work to learn the fundamentals of what makes your skill mix awesome. And if you do that, when you do have those rare opportunities, when you get lucky and, and people do find your restaurant and they stick around, you actually have the skill set and the work ethic and all that stuff, you, you, the knowledge to continue to give, give them stuff that they want and that they're going to love. I still am continuing to refine my stuff all the time. I mean, you can look through my channel. There's an immense amount of experimentation and just, and tests. I did, you know, explained with food is obviously a huge one, like food news, uh, doing all the Twitch chat stuff, trying like joke narrators or narrate like the narrator like sending like the story off in weird tangents or you know or having like a video totally derail the story or uh like weird th like cri the christmas theme skyrim video like that's fucking weird or uh or using new tools like the artificial intelligence or random inputs uh second channel edits doing uh more or less streaming or trying more or less casual streams or more like focusing more on my interactions with twitch chat rather than on the story as much working with editors that's been like a big thing of of like changing the work process so that I can actually delegate a lot of the work and experimentation on how to do that, collaborating with other people. I test new shit all the fucking time, constantly. And I, that's what I credit with the growth of my channel. If I had not, if like, if when my channel succeeded, you know, in the beginning of 2019, if I had just stopped trying new things there and I had just done those videos for the rest of time, probably would not have grown anymore. I probably would have been at 150,000 subs and that would that would continue, but I've continued to try and grow. Uh, experiments are how you grow. And so the one year plan is you putting in a shitload of experiments and cooking a bunch of new dishes, but all I will, you know, give the give the secret even when you succeed this goes on forever. This is just the mentality you need to have to get better. This is the mentality that you need to have for your skill mix and your menu to bang ass and be awesome and that's how you make it. So that when a person finds what you're doing, when you get one of those lucky opportunities where people are exposed to the work that you're doing, that they stick around and go, holy shit, I can't get this anywhere else. I fucking love this. I'm now a diehard longtime viewer. So we're getting to the end of this, but the one year plan, if you stick to it, it forces you to cook many new dishes. By doing so, you will eventually find the great combos and the specific ways that you wanna cook for your menu. And when the audience finds you, they're gonna fucking love it. You're not gonna succeed overnight. Breakthroughs, like I mentioned, they happen over months. You'll have little breakthroughs here and there, but it, you know, you should not expect that at one year, things suddenly blow up. Even for me, that you know, the one year of YouTube YouTube, that was preceded by three or four years of trying other things. But the one year plan that I did, like I mentioned, had this massively accelerated growth of both my own learning and like potency of what I was doing because of the skill mix and the new, the new test every week. Again, the one year plan, if you commit to it, the hard part about content creation is to keep going through failure. You need to get yourself in the mindset. There's a lot of people who are new content creators and they're like, Hey, you know, I've been putting out a couple new videos and people don't, I put out a couple videos and people don't really seem to like it. Hey, I've been streaming for a couple weeks, but like nobody's really watching. You got to get ready for a whole fucking load of failure, man. That's how this works. Um, it's going to take you, if you're just starting, you've never done a, you know, a creative thing in your life, it's probably going to take you years. Okay. You're going to have breakthroughs that happen over months, but getting to a point where people are really super passionate about what you're doing and that you are frequently getting the chance for it to be shown and mar you know, and, and shared with a lot of people, it's going to take you years. And again, not years of sitting around thinking about doing YouTube and Twitch or TikTok or whatever the fuck you're doing. Years of working and working hard, of trying new things, of putting yourself out there. It's going to be embarrassing. The failures are going to hurt. You're going to have to dedicate a lot of time and energy to it. Everything in your life is going to tell you to quit, okay? There is always a reason not to do something. It is not hard to find a reason not to do something. And after your first couple of weeks, maybe even first couple of days, you're going to go, well... 
nobody's watching my stream and nobody cares about my TikTok and nobody likes my YouTube channel and I, my work is really busy and my, my relationship is I need to spend more time there and I want to spend time with my friends. I want to do this travel and I'm sick and what you're, you're gonna, there's going to be a million reasons not to do it. The hard part is to keep going and to not quit. And if you can push past that, you are going to dramatically increase your chance of succeeding as a content creator. One thing I recommend for this is the don't break the chain method. This is uh, from Jerry Seinfeld. So the idea is go buy a calendar, you know, with like squares for every day, you put that up on your wall. And every time, every week when you've completed your content, right? When you, you've done that thing for that week, you check a black X or whatever color X, you, you X over all of the days on that week, okay? So on the calendar, you, you're looking at the thing and it's X'd out for that week indicating you did it, okay? And the first couple weeks that you're gonna do this, uh, you'll probably have a lot of motivation, motivation. You'll be like, yeah, this is great. And then weeks three, four, five, six, whatever, you're gonna be like, I, there's no fucking chance. It's too saturated and I feel, this feels hopeless and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm too busy and uh, the million other things, there's, there's gonna be a, a million reasons all the time, always. And then you can look at that calendar and you can go, fuck dude, I've done it for 50 days. I've done it for 50, I, can't, I don't wanna break the chain right now. And you're gonna have to look at that calendar and see, like you're gonna have to see a big gap if you miss a week and just don't break the chain. That's it, do not break the chain. And having that calendar there and reminding yourself just every fucking day, don't break the chain, will hopefully allow, uh, let it be easier to prioritize you doing the work every week, cooking a new thing every week, even though you're not getting a bunch of external success and praise for it, learning a new thing every week to prioritize that over all the other bullshit that life is gonna throw at you. I guarantee you, there's not a single successful content creator where life was just easy and they just, every week it was easy and they were super motivated. No, every single creator, period, in any genre, in any place of all time ever, struggles. You struggle all the time. I struggle all the fucking time. I struggled the whole year that I did this. I've struggled every time I've done anything creative ever. You will think it's the worst thing you've ever made half the time. But if you keep doing this, if you find your skill mix and you test something new with it every single week, your growth will be insane and the odds of somebody sticking around when they find you go up astronomically. You just can't quit. You cannot quit. And when you wanna quit, just remember, every single successful content creator had the exact same experience where the world told them, hey, don't, you know, just don't keep going, just don't keep going. And they said, no, fuck you world, I'm gonna keep going. I've had hundreds of those moments. There's so many fucking times. The world will do everything it can. It will do everything. And you have to turn on it, you have to say, fuck you world. Fuck you, I'm doing this. I don't care about, I'm gonna give up my money. I'm gonna give up my relationships. I'm gonna stop like my social life. I'll do nothing will top the content creation. And if you have that attitude, you will eventually win. And if you don't, best of luck to you, but you're probably not gonna put in enough refs to succeed. It doesn't have to be that extreme. I'm a little extreme with this stuff, but like it has to be pretty extreme because there's, 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 there's gonna be a billion reasons not to do it. And if you care enough about doing this job, if you care enough about building it, that's the attitude you need to have. It needs to take priority over everything else. Cool, how long has this been? Like an hour and a half. This is a long fucking video. We're basically at the end. We have talked about good versus great, the importance of great. We've talked about your skill mix. We've talked about doing this a whole bunch and not quitting. Okay, when does your content finally succeed? This is probably the question you wanted to know at the beginning of like, hey, how long, when exactly do I become a famous YouTuber? As I've stated, if you do these steps, you will eventually make great content that people love. Um, that's a guarantee. You can control that. You can, you can guarantee that in time you can make great content. The thing you cannot control ever is when people find your content. In the food court analogy, you can show up to the food court. You can set up your new Italian, you know, spaghetti hamburger thing, whatever the fuck, and you can spend a year or two or five years just grind, I don't wanna use the word grinding, testing new stuff, becoming better every single week, learning. And by the end of that couple years, you might be fucking unbelievable, but you still can't control when people find that you exist. You still can't control when people find your stuff. This is where luck comes in. Luck, in the context of content creation, is basically people finding out you exist, like people finding your stuff. It is super important again, luck doesn't matter without great content. You have to learn to make great stuff first and then luck and marketing matter, right? So many people get this wrong. If you go on like the Reddit for like Twitch and YouTube and all this stuff, everybody's trying to like promote their shit. Everybody's like, oh, I'm a small YouTuber. Like I'm a small streamer, come check out my stuff. And then you go watch their stuff and it's very, very, very generic or boring. And it's like, dude, it doesn't matter how many people come watch your stuff. If it's boring, if it's mediocre, if it's replaceable, right? It's gotta be unique. And then you need luck. Luck is unfair. 
It is really unfair. And it's going to be super, super fucking discouraging for you because even as you're working super hard and you've put in six months or 12 months and you can tell how much better you are and you're going like I was, you're going, what the fuck, man? I'm working so hard and I think this stuff is great and, and people are telling me it's great. You know, and I still had to wait like five months after getting to a point where I thought it was great. After putting in like years of work, I still had to wait five more months before YouTube was like, nah, okay, yeah, come on, come on into the club. You're, you're successful now. But here's the important uh, thing to remember. You can control the amount of luck. It's not totally out of your control. Here's the analogy that I think helps a lot. It is like a lottery, okay? Every week that you make a new piece of content and you put it out into the world, you are playing the lottery. And, you know, you, you buy one ticket, you're probably not going to win the lottery, right? There's no fucking way. If you, if, if, again, this is like the importance of long-term thinking. If you, if you try for a couple weeks, the odds of you winning the lottery are basically zero. You're not going to win the lottery. And the lottery means, you know, you get a bunch of attention on your channel. For some reason, people find, like, you blow up and get you get the attention that your great content deserves. But here is the secret to the lottery. As you improve as a content creator, you get to enter more tickets into the lottery every week. You don't just play with one ticket every week. As your content gets better, you are putting in more tickets. So again, think about me at the beginning of 2018 versus the end. At the beginning of 2018, I had no strong vision for what I was doing. I was really unclear what worked and what didn't. I was just sort of like imitating other people. And so when I made a video in January of that year, the odds of it winning the lottery were very, very, very small. But as the that year went by and I was doing more tests and I fit, you know, found my skill mix and I'm like making it more potent, I'm trying new things. And I really am starting to go like, okay, I, I really think I'm like landing on something here. I am really loving what he's doing. Now every video I put out is like a thousand tickets. One ticket, you're probably not gonna win the lottery. But if every week you play with a thousand tickets, well, shit, your odds are decent. They're not great. Again, it's the fucking lottery. It's not fair, but your odds are way better than when you started. And this just keeps going. I mean, if you just keep improving over years, think about anybody. If somebody is making the best content of all time, if like Mr. Beast, for example, nobody knew who he was, but he was making crazy fucking shit like he's doing right now. He's playing the lottery with tens of thousands of tickets every time he puts a video out into the world. And even if nobody knows who he was, who he is, the odds that he wins the lottery are so much higher than me who just tried a new thing for the first time in January 2018. I got lucky, and this is, you know, it's important to recognize, I got super fucking lucky, and you're gonna have to get lucky too. But I won the lottery because of years of improving. I worked really hard to make my skill mix great. I spent a fuckload of time and effort to make what I was doing really great, and I played the lottery every single week. I got better every single week because putting putting in the effort to try new things and learn, and so my odds got better. Eventually I won the lottery, but I got lucky because of the work I did on my skill mix. You, if you are listening to this, you will probably have to wait a long time too. Almost every single person does. Even the people who don't have to wait long usually fizzle out because, again, they haven't put in the work to build the foundation to understand what to do when they get lucky. But I really strongly believe, and this is where I am different and more optimistic than a lot of content creators, if you improve every week, you will win the lottery eventually. You will. I see a lot of other content creators be like, somebody will ask like, oh, how do you become a content creator? And they'll be like, you have to get lucky. I got lucky. It's too late, you, but you just have to get lucky. I mean, technically, yes, but it's in your control. And the, the, the really helpful thing to remember, there's a lottery winner every week. Somebody is going to win, okay? There's always going to be a new creator that appears on YouTube because the algorithm promotes their stuff. There's new people on TikTok every fucking day. There's new people on Twitter. Name the platform. There's gonna be new platforms in the future. This is going to be true until the rest of time. There's always going to be a lottery winner. There's always gonna be somebody who gets shown to a lot of new people. And in the case of social media now, it's like thousands of people every day. It's unfair, but it could be you. And if you choose to play the lottery in a smart way and to improve your odds every week, eventually you will win. I believe that. You will win eventually. It's inevitable. If you're playing with a million fucking tickets every week, you're eventually going to win the lottery. And it might have taken you many, many years to get there, but it's going to happen eventually. George R. Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, right, who is now considered one of the most successful authors of all time, like one of the greatest authors of all time, wrote Game of Thrones when he was 48. 48. He was a writer his whole life, uh, at least the vast, vast majority, writer's whole life was writing shit constantly. 
And at age 48 is when he got lucky. But at that point, he wrote Game of Fucking Thrones. He was buying 10 million lottery tickets. He's going to fucking win the lottery eventually. But he had to put in the work to get that good. Another piece about this, which is frustrating, which you should keep in mind as you go on this journey, you will improve at a constant rate going up. All right. So if this is if this is you improving, right, you on week one of starting this journey to the time you hit the lottery, you are improving steadily. So your skill set grows up, but public recognition comes in bursts. The public will know nothing about you. And this will continue for a long period of time until you win the lottery. And then it goes, boom. Okay. For me, I had 1000 views per video in all of 2018. And not only that, every time I put out a video, my views and subs dropped. So even though I was getting better, my viewership was literally going down every week because people like the only people who were around were Hearthstone viewers who were like, what the fuck is this weird game goal teaching shit you're doing? So there's a, there's a huge disconnect. And this is true of everybody, huge disconnect between your improvement level and a moment where people suddenly realize where you're at. And it's, that makes it very hard because you have to go through these long periods where you're getting way better and you know it. And maybe your close friends who you're showing to know it, but you just have to wait until the world finally goes, oh, I see you, I see you, and they jump up. So for me, it was like 1,000 views per video for five months, for a year, and then suddenly, boom, overnight, 300,000. Even though I had done the fucking work over a year and been getting better, like it, it's, it's that one moment that suddenly things catch up. George R. R. Martin, again, great example. Another, other examples are like Dream on YouTube. Like he was doing YouTube for years, was getting better and better and better and better, People didn't really notice what he was doing, like little things here and there. And then suddenly he released like the Manhunt series and just like, boom, right? Like it jumped way, way, way the fuck up in terms of other, the external world's recognition of where he was at, even though he had been putting in the work to get better. And again, that's regardless of what you think. Ninja is another example. Regardless of what you think about Dream or Ninja, both of those guys put in years and years of work where they were improving their skills. And then suddenly for Ninja, it was Fortnite. Things explode and he becomes this like global superstar even though like two weeks prior, he had just been a, like a random small streamer that had been putting in the work for like eight straight years. Again, this is all the importance of the one year plan or multi-year plan if you stick with it. I, I think you should do a full year and commit to that and then you can see where you are after that point. But again, it's it's you gotta stick to the long term because you're not gonna get external recognition early on. Things are gonna fail and make it feel like it's it's not it's not possible. But if you focus on your own growth, if you just get better every single week, you will eventually win the lottery. And suddenly people will go, oh. What you're doing is awesome. One of the weirdest experiences I had is that for five months, I was posting Doug Doug videos. This is like right after I relaunched Doug Doug. And I was posting a video every week. I was doing this full time. I was trying new things every week. I was like, I'm, I really believe in what I'm doing. And my views are just dropping. And the comments are like, this is weird. I don't like this. Every, everything was saying, no, this is bad. All the signs externally were like, hey, Doug, what you're doing is fucking weird and nobody will like it. Everything was telling me that. I was getting job offers from previous people who were like, Doug, I mean, come on. Like, you can come back and do some work for us, right? And I was like, no. No, I literally got like very lucrative job offers that I was like, no, I'm not. I have to keep doing this. And then this is five straight months of just like being in my bedroom making stuff and it's all failing. And then suddenly overnight, YouTube is like, hey, Doug, do you want to be a successful YouTuber? And I'm like, yes, please. And I started getting all these comments on the videos that were five months old saying like, wow, this is so great. You're amazing. Like I, this is like the most creative stuff. Like I love your style. Like nothing else is like this right now. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> I went through like five months of everybody of like the whole world telling me it sucked. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta go through this period. We gotta believe in yourself first because the rest of the world isn't gonna believe in you until suddenly they believe in you a lot. It's weird. It's a bizarre disconnect and it's a dumb part of this whole journey. This whole journey is fucking dumb. But again, if you're super passionate about it, it'll work eventually. You just gotta put up with a lot of bullshit in the meantime. Okay, we're basically actually sort of at the end now. I uh, have some final miscellaneous thoughts that don't fit into the core thing. Again, to summarize, my entire viewpoint on this, great content, great irreplaceable content that you can't get elsewhere. That's how you grow an audience. To do this, you have to find your skill mix. You combine those two things. You test one new idea uh, with your skill mix every week for one year. You write down what you learned. And by the end of that year, I think you will be making great content. I really do. And hopefully, I sincerely hope for you that you don't have to play the lottery for too much longer after that um, to do this as a career because it is an awesome career. It's just a lot, a lot, a lot of bullshit you gotta, you gotta push through. Uh, but that's also what makes it worth it, right? I wouldn't give a fuck about my, you can see it there. 
That's the 100,000 sub badge that I got. When YouTube blew up my channel and was like, hey, you, you're, you're successful now, it was overnight. And it was after five months of me pushing through that shit and believing in myself and getting better. And that full year of like testing stuff every single, every single week and, and getting new stuff. And that was the most meaningful thing in my life. It was like, I believed in myself first and I pushed through it. I prioritized this over all the other temptations. I prioritized this over all the things that the world wanted me to give up. I believed in myself and I kept going and then I succeeded. Like that plaque represents to me years of believing in myself when the whole world gave me every reason not to and that eventually the world recognized it. And that was such an intense and fucking hard journey. And when, and when that happened, that was the most meaningful thing that's happened in my life. I also have a 1 million subscriber plaque. That shit's in my closet. I don't care about it. I don't care because a million was just like, a million was just later on, right? That was just more, more people had found my channel. But like that, that represents the journey of fucking pushing through and focusing on the long term and believing yourself despite everything and not quitting. And when that happens to you, oh my God, nothing can compare. And I hope that you, if you're watching and this resonates with you, that you get to have that same experience. But, you know, the experience is only there because of all the hardships, because you put in the work. That's what makes it meaningful. Okay, with that, some additional kind of final miscellaneous thoughts. I'll try to get through these kind of quick. It is important to remember that I've sort of touched on this already, but like great is specific to the individual. There is not a universal great. And there's this weird paradox that the more appealing something is to one group, the less appealing it is to other people. Talk about Dark Souls as, as an example. The reason that people love Dark Souls so much is the same reason most people hate it. Every content creator is like this. The more you lean into what you specifically can do and what makes you a fucking awesome creator, the more I make my shit like weird <laughs> and just very like Doug, the more the people who are really into that fucking love my stuff and the more I see comments of people being like, this guy is fucking weird. He tries too hard. He thinks he's funny. This isn't like you get all those negative comments because the more you're making it awesome for your group, the people who really love your restaurant, the less appealing it is to people who want something else. As a quick story here, one of my videos, Skyrim, can you cross Skyrim with fast travel? The video, it's an early Doug Doug video that where you, I ran across Skyrim and there's this poop joke in it. <laughs> like it's like poo stain joke where the whole video is like basically leading up to this poop joke. And I remember when I wrote it, when I was working on the video, I was like, this is the funniest fucking thing I've done in my entire life. And I was like crying with laughter when I thought of the idea and I almost cut it. I was like, I, I it's one of those, I was like, I can't include that. I was like laughing. I can't include this. I cannot include this poo stain joke. That is, that this is so immature and dumb. And there's going to be so many people who like think I'm this dumb, immature person and are just going to be super turned off by this whole thing. But again, I was in this whole thing of like, okay, nope, nope. I got to focus on what I can do really well. And this is like the funniest thing in the world to me. I got to leave it in. And that joke is people's favorite part about that video. That video ended up becoming very successful and like was one of the videos that helped explode my channel and make it big. And like most people like just like the poo stain thing. At the same time, there's a lot of people who are like, this guy is fucking dumb. This is all a poop joke. <laughs> And so again, it's this example, like you're going to have a lot of moments where you are like, whoa, I have this idea, but it's weird and it's dumb and people won't like it. You got to stay focused on like, if you have that feeling and you're like, I would love this, it has to go in. It has to go in because what you've just touched on is something that is super specific and awesome to your genre, to your fusion restaurant. And the people who do want that are like you. And they're going to come in and be like, that's the greatest fucking thing in the world. And that person is going to be a lifelong fan of you now. Every time you have that feeling and you're going to have them, like you got to stick with it. I have that shit all the time. <laughs> I put out a video like last week where I put an entire two minute infomercial in my YouTube video because that's funny to me. And I saw a bunch of people be like, why is this in here? This is not funny. This is one of your worst videos ever, Doug. And then there's other comments are like, I'm fucking dying. There's an entire infomercial in this video and I'm making videos for that guy. I'm making it for that guy because that guy is going to have the best fucking experience of his life when he watches my videos. And if I'm trying to grow, that's how I capture that guy and have not like physically in my basement or whatever, but like how I get him interested in, in what I'm doing forever. A great quote or analogy that I heard from, I think Tim Urban is imagine that you are creating stuff for an arena full of yourself. Okay. For me, it's like a, a stadium, like a sports stadium full of dugs. Literally you, like a clone, you know, 40,000 clones of you in a stadium. And I try to remember that when I think of a weird joke or something, I'm like, would that audience love that? And I'm like, 
fuck yeah, they would. Holy shit. That's so funny to, to the Dugs. And that's a really helpful filter because if you're, if you get too caught up with like, okay, what will everybody kind of like? No, you're going to stray away from what you are specifically good at. Again, that's the whole point of this entire fucking rant is like to get amazing at the two things you're great at and to make those as entertaining as possible. You can't do that if you're focusing on people who want five guys. You will not make the best fusion restaurant if you're focusing on people who want something else. So you got to remember that like if you come across something that you love, it's going to receive an equal amount of hate, but that means you're doing a good job. That means it's successful. Okay, that's an important idea. Another one is just a reminder, something being great is not about the amount of hours that you spend on it. It's not about the production value. Again, nobody gives a fuck about your audio or video or anything technical. It's tempting to get sort of like drawn into those types of things. It's tempting when you make something to be like, I don't love this, but maybe I should just like put in a lot more hours or like put in a lot of animation or whatever. But something being great is about your skill mix being there in a really, really potent ways. You, you, again, you, the whole point of this is to find what is the menu that you can make for your restaurant that is super fucking potent. That's not about the hours spent. Like making a great dish, if you're a chef, is not about how many hours you put into it, right? It is about the, the few decisions that you do make that make a huge impact. You know, with my own videos, I could spend, you know, I could just put an additional 50 hours into every video and we could just add a shitload of animation and custom visuals and whatever the fuck. But I try to avoid all those things because I don't think they're part of my skill mix. I try to focus on what is the skill mix that I'm offering and put effort into those. Try to remember not to get tempted in that stuff. And you will, and it happens to me all the time, but it's just part, it's part of this whole philosophy of skill mix is that's the guide of what you are supposed to focus on. And it's gonna help you hopefully fend off all the other shit that feels tempting and isn't actually important. Just remember that something that is simple and potent is way better than something that is big and boring. There's so many movies that are great examples of this. There's tiny little small budget indie movies that people fucking love. And then you have gigantic blockbuster movies that are all production value that nobody cares about. Try to remember that for yourself. Try to just focus on making the decisions that are gonna have a big impact. A follow-up that's related is that a helpful tool for deciding what to work on, um, especially as you test out new things, is the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is this idea that 80% of your success and like the value you create comes from just 20% of your work. It's also the opposite is true. That 80% of like the stress and the hardship you have comes from just like 20% of the stuff in your life. This is true of everything. You can apply it to a specific project, to a video, to your broader, you know, broader creative vibe. You can apply it to your relationships, to your life, anything. 80-20 is pretty much true wherever. The, the point, at least for me, of where I think it becomes a helpful tool is just if you're struggling with stuff, if things just feel really hard, if things feel really difficult, if you're struggling with what to decide to do, it's helpful to kind of look at what is going on in your kind of portfolio of work and say, what are the few pieces that are really causing a lot of joy or a lot of value or getting a lot of action, right? And then conversely, what are the few pieces that are really causing a disproportionate amount of stress and hardship? And when you do that, it becomes a lot easier to go like, oh, well, I'm going to just focus on the 20% then. That shit is awesome. And oh, this 20% of stuff is giving me a really hard time. Maybe it's in a video, right? You're making a video in like one portion of the video, like 20% of it. You feel like you should do it, but it's just like torturing you. That's a great sign to cut that shit out. Again, the whole point of this overall idea is just to stay hyper-focused on the things you're great at. And that means you have to cut out the other stuff. If you get bogged down by a bunch of shit that you're not really naturally gifted at, it's gonna, everything else is drawn down with it. Your time, your valuable limited time is put into that thing. So the 80-20 rule is a way to analyze what's going on and say, okay, these are the pieces that are really making an impact. We're gonna double down on these. These are the pieces that are not. We're gonna cut that shit away. And this is helpful for, you know, whether you're analyzing streams, books, movies, anything. It's very, very helpful. Another piece here that is uh, important to recognize, once you have an audience, you can maintain that audience with good content, not with great content. So me, at my size as a creator, I'm very fortunate. I don't have to make something that's like great all the time. I try to do it a lot, but um, you know, if I just show up and I do like a good video, which I've definitely done on YouTube, I'm not, it's not like every video I've done has been like some incredible piece of art. Because I have an audience that already likes what I'm doing and is familiar with me, I can just put out good stuff and for the most part maintain that existing audience. Again, greatness about that like super unique thing that's super potent that can't be replaced, that is about how you grow an audience, right? That content is the stuff that will actually keep new people sticking around when they find out about you, whereas your good content won't do that. So it might feel it might feel a little bit unfair when you like look at other creators and be like, 
you know, that guy doesn't look like he's working that hard. Why does he have millions of views? Again, he, even if that's the case, he had great content when he or she had great content when they were building their channel or their audience or whatever. That's how you grow. And then you have the luxury of just maintaining with good content after the fact. Okay, on marketing and distribution of your content. Other content creators are a lot better at this than I am. I am not great as a marketer or anything like that. I am not great at, you know, understanding how to get a lot of people to be interested in my stuff. These are things like, when do you schedule videos or streams? What platform do you stream on? What time do you stream on? The titles, the thumbnails, the tech, tech stuff, all that sort of thing. Again, marketing works once you've made great content. You gotta figure out what your content is first and be great at it and go cook 100 dishes or 52 dishes in a year. Go to that first and then start worrying about marketing. That being said, there are a couple like broad tips that I would recommend to be cognizant of even while you're sort of in your learning stage. Stage One is brained, na brained, brand naming. So whatever your channel or, you know, brand is that you're creating, make it easily memorable and easily spellable. This is a mistake that I did in my early Hearthstone days. My name was Glutus and it was a picture of my face and it was blurred. And I actually talked with another content creator around that time who, who was much better at this and was like, hey, your, this is not good. I, your name is not memorable. It doesn't like, I don't know how to spell it or say it. And your logo is just like a picture of your face. Here's an example of good stuff. And I was like, oh shit. So when I revamped my channel as Doug Doug, I did that because I wanted to rebrand as a name that was easily memorable, easily spellable. Doug Doug is a great, just catchy name, right? I also rebranded as initially it was like a dog and then I swapped to the bell pepper with the explained with food series. And again, it was like, I want something that's super simple, super memorable. And I think the brand naming is important because when a person comes and finds your stuff, the easier it is for them to remember who you are, the, the easier it is for them to come back to your stuff in the future or to tell others about it. Okay, you also want to put your work out into a place where it can spread. So Twitch, if you're interested in streaming, has zero discovery, okay? You basically cannot grow on Twitch if you just stream. Uh, stream Twitch, Twitch's platform does not have a way, uh, at least an effective way, to show your stream to like new people and get them interested in it. YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter all do have a fair amount of, and Facebook, I guess to some degree, I'm not as familiar, um, all have discovery, right? They have algorithms that their whole job is just to show content to people. Another way to think about this, you gotta play the lottery somewhere. If you just stream on Twitch to zero viewers, that is not playing the lottery. And just to touch on Twitch again specifically, if you're interested in streaming on Twitch, especially on Twitch, but even on YouTube or Facebook at this point, the way you grow as a streamer is to grow on other platforms, okay? Do not expect to have any growth from streaming. You grow from TikTok or YouTube or Twitter, and then you use those platforms to get people interested in what you are doing. The only exception to this is if you do a lot of collaborative content with other uh, creators on Twitch, but even then you are basically at like a, a, a pretty low ceiling and you need these other platforms to get people interested in what you're doing to then be willing to come spend hours watching you. That's a big commitment. If you're trying to stream, you have to be successful on another platform first. Sorry, that's how it works. For me, that meant growing a YouTube channel first. I, I love streaming, I'm proud of my stream, but I consider myself a YouTuber. And that is part because that's where I put a shitload of effort but it, it, and, and where I started and what I think I'm best at. But it's also because that, like the Twitch, it only exists because of the YouTube, right? Gotta grow an audience somewhere, don't do it on Twitch. And the very last thing, are some tips that I have for not quitting. Again, this is one of the absolute most important things and uh, the vast majority of people who watch this, or I should even say the vast majority of people who try content creation, which is so many people nowadays, they're all gonna quit. Everybody fucking quits. Most people are gonna be in that like three to six week range. I think that's when it really gets hard to keep going. But the vast, 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 vast majority of people quit. And that is the problem. You have absolutely zero chance of becoming a content creator if you quit. You have zero chance of winning the lottery if you quit, if you don't play the lottery every week. Some tips that were helpful for me when I went through, uh, you know, multiple long periods of my life where I was like burning off all my money and it was failing and everything told me it was not gonna work, uh, but I was refusing to quit. Things that helped me a lot, write out your goals, write out why you care about this. Why is it important to you to be a content creator? And again, we're talking about like doing it as a job, not just doing it for fun. If it's doing it as your job, why is that important? Why do you have to do that? Why, you know, list out all the things in your life, write that shit down and then read it every morning. You wake up and you read it so that as you go throughout the day and you, and you encounter failure and hardship and things don't work out the way you want, that you are keeping in mind why this is important. Keep in mind the long-term point of view. It's similar to the whole point of the one-year plan, which is to get you out of the, the mentality that, oh God, I have to make a great YouTube video this week and getting you into the mentality of no, over one year or two years or three years, 
I am going to become great by the end of it. I also recommend reading motivational quotes. Uh, there's a lot of motivational quotes out there. There's a book I love uh, by Tim Ferriss called Tools of Titans, which is where a lot of these ideas kind of came from. It's all like quotes from his podcast with very successful people. There's a lot of wonderful themes and quotes in there. So I have uh, I have a big old fucking document of quotes that I would read literally every single morning in that whole period, because it's really helpful when you, again, encounter failure every single day and you encounter hardship every day. Creating stuff is not easy ever. Even once you succeed as a business, it's not easy. Reading those quotes gets you pumped. And it also reminds you that every creator goes through this, that there is no person who does this as a job who was able to just like coast on in and had an easy time. You remember that every single fucking person, including some very, very famous, very, very successful people also went through what you're going through. And I think that's very helpful to keep going. I think it's also helpful to look at the journey that other content creators went through. Everybody struggled for years. I mentioned Dream and Ninja. There are so many examples. I would go look at other creators who I thought were like kind of in my vibe or, or that I could aspire to in terms of like their levels of success. And I would look at their social blade, which is a website that shows like their subscriber numbers. And I would see, okay, they had nobody watching for 11 months. They put out videos for 11 fucking months and they were good. And then it jumped up, right? And so I would look at that just to remind myself when I was in month two or month three, I was going, this is fucking hard. I don't know if this is gonna ever work. Maybe I'm being a uh, like a dumb idiot here. And I would look at that and go, no, like I know I can do it. Everybody goes through these journeys. Again, I think you should write down what you've learned so far. Again, every week you should write down, what did I learn from this experiment? What did I learn from the new ingredient I tried? And then reread it because then you have this giant diary of how much progress you've made. You know, if you're three months in and you're like, I don't know. I'm thinking of quitting. I just don't see how this possibly works. I, I don't know. This is this. Then you can open up this document and be like, wow, I am way better than I was three months ago. And for me, that's really encouraging. And it helps remind you of like, okay, if that's three months, what can I do in 12? Like that was one of the things I told myself. I was like, even if I do run out of money and I have to go back to, you know, an old, to a, to a producing job in esports or whatever, what I've learned here is going to be so valuable for me. So remind yourself of the progress you've made. That's going to, it's going to help through all the short term pain. And again, I think, uh, three to five weeks is the hard point, but there are lots of hard points and, uh, I just gotta, you just gotta keep going. And I really, really, really wish you the best with it. I, it's, a. Uh, just a phenomenally challenging and rewarding journey. I, I think everybody should go through it, but it is it is very, very, very hard. And um, just don't quit. Just don't quit. Cool. And that is it. That's Doug Doug's advice for content creation. Um, I, I really hope this helped. I, I hope you learned. I sincerely wish you the best of luck if you choose to go on this journey. As I've said several times, it is very long and a very hard, uh, very hard journey, but it is um, just wildly rewarding. Um, and I hope it would be very, very cool if, you know, just a single person out there, if this video kind of clarifies some thinking or like, a, you know, a, a way of approaching content or a way of scheduling their year and their adventure that, that helps them succeed because God, what a, what a crazy weird world we're in. And also like, it seems the future, you know, as we, as we get older, I think everybody's going to kind of be a, going to be a content creator in, to some degree. So I think everybody is going to kind of have to go through this journey to some degree in their lives, given just how integrated all this stuff is in the future. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you become the greatest Mexican-Italian chef this world's ever seen. Goodbye.